Hello there, person. Let's check out what's new with making the game Wraithbinder. This week, I've been working on map art styles. This is really cool because it freshens everything up with um, how uh, the art style um, changes the look of the level. So this is the old art style. This is the, fir the first art style, you can say. Um, it's kind of got a rockier texture to it. And uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to turn on this debug setting here to automatically choose the the next art style. So uh, each art style is represented with a single letter, a single character, which is really easy for the code to match everything up like that. So this is the second art style. And uh, in this art style, we have sort of a different background going on and slightly different um, objects uh, for all the art for the different objects. So. As you can see in this art style, we can rotate around the camera a little bit and we've got every little bit of ground has an extension extending off down below it, which is actually a two dimensional sprite. So the rest of Wraithbinder is on all entirely 3D sprites, uh, 3D uh, voxel models. However, um, it became very expensive to try and render these huge sections of ground going underneath every single one of the, the pieces of ground. Uh, because these are 240 pixels tall, uh, imagine a, a voxel model with 240 pixels tall, that's that's huge. Because you have to multiply it by the Z dimension, so it's not just a two-dimensional uh, amount of data, it's a three-dimensional amount of data, which really significantly increases the amount of stuff that it has to render. And uh, anyways, so uh, that all said, these two-dimensional sprites are working out pretty well. Um, I love the way they look, and they're just background elements anyways, so why why go through all the process of making them three, fully 3D anyways? Um, uh, so let's take a look at some of the art behind all this. Uh, here is the two-dimensional sprite that's being used for this underground um, map. Oh, I'm calling it background art style. The other background we saw before this was the clouds uh, background art style. It just has a bunch of clouds going by. This is the underground art style, which every one of the pieces of ground has this underground element. So this is just um, this is basically just a gradient layer with um, another layer on top of it to make the right side look a little bit brighter. And um, <clears throat> you'll notice actually when when I switch the camera angle, um, it'll flippy flop which side is which. So if we how do I actually rotate a cam? I've never I've never used this tool in. Uh, Photoshop to rotate the canvas. Flip horizontal, maybe? Is that actually just viewing? Yeah, I think that's just viewing flip horizontal. Oh, this is okay. This is a really important thing I should know <laughs> how to actually flip the canvas without flipping your art. Uh, so, this is basically uh, in the game, if it detects that the camera light is or the light source is coming from uh, the other direction, it'll actually flip over this sprite and make it look like it's uh, matching the, um, the light source. So it's really nice to have this, uh, this layer in there to brighten up one side because it really gives it a 3D element. Um, and also it really is really nice to have this sort of uh, coming to a point here at the very bottom. Um, that makes it also look like it's very 3D if we add in both these elements, this lighter side on the right and this, uh, this V shape at the bottom. We get a really nice aesthetic inside the game. So that's what this piece of art is here and then each of the um, each of the different art styles has uh, like I said at the beginning a letter so um, now in uh, there's certain entities inside uh, that will actually change every level and certain entities will not for example the guardians and the menders and all the things that, that are objects that it, you interact with that you want to be consistent every time those are the exact same artwork but things like pillars, those can be unique for each different art style. So this pillar here, let's take a look at the original pillar. Here's pillar AA. That's pillar map art style A and then pillar style A. So this is what the original one looked like, right? Sort of a rocky, rougher look to it. And then we've got another alternate. This is AB, which is map art style A pillar style B and uh, here's what this one looks like a little blockier uh, but still sort of very rough looking 
Then we've got pillar BA, which is map art style B, pillar style A. And this is what this one looks like. So it's a little bit different. It's got these sort of indented sides and this sort of like inverted pyramid and then another pyramid-y shape going in the middle there. And, uh, and then we've got pillar BB, very similar. Um, so <clears throat> at runtime, the game will determine its style character mostly by random, uh, but I've got this overridden. So let's go ahead and uh, I'll turn off the override and we'll take a look at things again inside the game. So I, all these elements will translate into different things inside the game and uh, there's walls will change, pillars change, uh, what else changes? The ground of course changes. The ground is a real big part of making it all look unique. So the, these ground elements here in this scene uh, are much shorter than the other one, the, uh, the, the original art style. The walls also look a little bit different. They also kind of look like these pillars a little bit. These are walls right here, these things. So pillars and walls are basically the same thing. A wall is kind of just like a, a tall pillar right now. You can harvest matter points from pillars as well as walls. So, um, I, think, I believe grass changes, but things like these, like like your uh, your statue will never change, the guardian will never change, the mender will never change. So those are consistent. So you can doesn't matter what map art style you're playing, they're going to look exactly the same. All right, so. Um, that's what's new with the art style. This is a really big thing because it will allow a lot of, it'll feel like the game has a lot more variety, especially when I start creating some map art styles that are much different. Like I want to do a thing that looks like the inside of a cave and maybe a jungle scene or, you know, any kind of art style can be created now at this point because we've got, it's all, all the basic structural elements to create different map art styles are almost finished. There's one last thing to do and that is to create different art styles for uh, for wall types. So right now this is considered like the sky wall type or cliff art type where all of the, the edges of of these sort of islands right here are surrounded by sky elements where you, you just can't walk onto the sky and uh, so a different, a different fundamental art style would be changing it so these are actual walls instead of sky. And that is left, I need, I need to do that still. Uh, but there's still there's a huge amount of um, work has been done to get these map art styles going. So, so that's great. Uh, that, that basically means that at this point in the game we've got only a little bit left to do to create procedurally generated maps. Because I've created all the basis for uh, changing all of the, the uh, blocks into a grid so that the grid can be procedurally generated and now we've got different map art styles so basically procedurally generated maps are one of the next things that will be done and that will enable a lot of things to be to uh, that will really enable the game to start being a lot more interesting to play uh, right now we've just got this single map layout and uh, creating, making this so that it's actually procedurally generated will be really fun there could be different maze patterns going on and um, make it just much more interesting to play uh, especially if, if you're someone like me who really enjoys novelty so <clears throat> uh, yeah so there's um we took a look at the art behind everything and we took a look at these map art styles and there are a few other things I've worked on this last week and um, that's really working on the bots the bots are a lot smarter now and uh, they use their range abilities more often They'll actually use the bossifier more often. They'll use temples and chests more often. They're better able to pick up items. There was a few issue, issues with the glitches, with uh, just the way they um, didn't quite pick some things up. And then I found this one bug where bots never ever gained any abilities because they never ticked their own uh, um, auto ability. Let's, let's take a look at that function, tick auto ability. This, uh, this auto ability function had something in it like this, like if e.ai return. So it wasn't quite that simple, but basically it, it was preventing all AI from ever automatically upgrading their abilities. So that was, that was a pretty simple fix, but uh, gosh, it was mind blowing. I'm like, oh my God, so you're telling me for the last like three months, no 
bots have ever upgraded one of their abilities? It explains a lot playing against these bots and they would always just swing their sword. I was like, why are you just swinging your sword? Because they were never using, they were never had any other abilities to use. So that was a big bug fix. I'm really glad to have that one solved. Um, also greatly improving the game performance during world erosion. That was something that, um, tick erosion, I think, yeah. Tick erosion basically goes and creates a whole bunch of callbacks in the tick system which create entities and uh, those are all before tick functions and I before this I was using a thing called erase if it to uh, erase different before tick functions once they're finished um, and let's take a look at erase if it basically erase if it loops over a container and says if this do erase code then erase the entity so erasing, if, if you've got a thousands of entities to remove in one single tick, and you go and you erase every single one of them one by one, that's going to be incredibly slow. And it, in fact, it was. It was super duper slow. Whenever I sped up the tick, the world erosion, the world erosion is when the world crushes down on itself and all the entities get destroyed until there's just a middle area that the players can duke it out uh, at the end there. Um, so the world erosion when you sped up the time really a lot like you say let's say you want to erode the entire world in just 10 seconds um, That would mean it would it would have to erode like thousands of entities per tick So this was extremely slow trying to erase every single one of these entities one by one So this is a much faster version of erase if where it goes and reserves it creates a new um, vector to or container to hold whatever vector it's looping over and then it reserves the amount of uh, of elements that it had all before and then it goes and does its do erase code okay for each element do erase code it actually pushes back if it's successful so basically that means that it's pushing into a new vector where it's already reserved all the data so it's not having to go see what's so slow about erasing a single element in a container is that it has to go and move all the existing elements sometimes so if it's a vector with it where its elements are contiguous in memory and you erase one in the middle of it, it's having to take a huge chunk of memory at the end and moving it, oh, just a tiny bit over that one entity that it erased, right? That's why that's so slow. So if you're going, this is a quite an optimization here where if you're looping over all the entities and you're just pushing them back into an, um, a container where you, everything is already contiguous, then it's much, much faster. Or, sorry, this is what I was talking about here. Much faster. And then at the end, it goes and assigns the new vector. So basically, that that was a big thing. And then um, all these things about making the bots use the boss of fire more often, and and, uh, and able to use the temples and chests better. That kind of boiled down to this one thing where basically the temples have um, two different collision entities. One is a trigger entity, so it's a big tr trigger entity. And then this smaller, different actual collision entity. Where's that at? object collision here it is so the the actual temple base is only 24 voxels wide but the the collision trigger is 48 voxels wide so what was happening was um it would even even the smallest entity right here is bigger than the actual grid size so the grid size is about uh 16 and the size of this temple is 24. so and the AI couldn't quite get to the very point that it was trying to as it would pathfind to the temple base, right? It's, it's trying to, let's say the bot is like, okay, I want to go to move towards this temple and hold it and get the ability that you get out of the temple. It would start, it would pathfind to the temple and the last dot on its pathfinding thing would be inside this temple that it could never get to because this temple size is 24 and it's trying to pathfind over sizes that are 16. So we've got this uh, function here, um, or it's smarter about how it does that. It goes and has this bit of code where it determines if it's already close enough to a large target. So a large target would be something like the temple where it's got this bigger size than the actual collision system size. So we've got collisions element size it determines and then the targets actual size. And then if that's bigger, then it can go ahead and clear the path if the path is already less than or equal to one element so if it's got that one last dot it's trying to move on that one last little place then it goes ahead and does it so um some really great stuff done with wraith binder this week 
thanks for watching this video and we'll come at you with another video showing you what's new next time later